Uh, as of right now, we have the 22 team tournament scheduled for July 31st for the NBA. And uh, we'll see if that ends up happening. Obviously, it's a little bit up in the air, but there is a lot of time between now and July 31st to kind of see how things play out. And so on this episode of the Athletic Acuity Sports Podcast, I'm going to be going over each of the 30 NBA teams and just sharing some thoughts about either their outlook for the upcoming tournament or just their outlook moving forward if they did not qualify for the 22-team tournament. And so I'm going to start out with the teams that did not qualify. I'll start out with the Golden State Warriors. The Warriors have accumulated a really healthy amount of assets. I want to start with the trade they made at the trade deadline, the most noteworthy. They traded D'Angelo Russell to the Timberwolves in exchange for Andrew Wiggins and the Timberwolves 2021 first round pick, only top three protected. I think there's a good chance that that pick is in the lottery and not in the top three. So Golden State may have picked up an additional lottery pick there. I also think that Andrew Wiggins isn't too much worse of a player than D'Angelo Russell. I actually think if those two went one for one, it wouldn't be as crazy as the trade that actually happened. Andrew Wiggins, only 25 years old, former first overall pick. I understand that he's had some ups and downs and, you know, there's been some moments where he just really looks disinterested, especially defensively. But... I think undoubtedly he fits in better with Steph Curry and Klay Thompson than D'Angelo Russell would have. So that's a pretty big asset for Golden State. Also, Wiggins makes less money than D'Angelo Russell. So I do think that the Warriors ended up with a really nice pair of assets in that trade. To go along with that, they are likely to get the first overall pick this year. Um, If not the first overall pick, you know, it's going to be a high selection, most likely. So the Warriors, I think, have put together a nice pile of assets moving forward. And, you know, of course, this season was a lost year. Steph Curry only played four games, I think. Clay missed the entire season. Durant's gone. But perhaps, you know, during this lost season, they've found... A couple guys who can be quality bench players for them when everyone comes back. I think Marquise Chris can be a bench player for them. Eric Paschal. Probably a couple other guys. And just looking forward to the 2020-2021 season, I think a lineup of Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, Draymond Green, I think that group could easily contend for a title. I think that they could easily stand up to either of the LA teams. Uh, I would not be dismissive of this Warriors team. People are forgetting perhaps that only a few years ago, they won 73 games without Kevin Durant and the year before that they won a title without Durant. A team on a very different trajectory is Minnesota. The team that I think was on the wrong side of that Russell Wiggins trade. The Timberwolves give up their 2021 first rounder just to get Russell. It felt like kind of a panic move on Minnesota's part just to appease Carl Anthony Towns, who was clearly unhappy with the situation there, and I don't blame him. So moving forward, they're going to have Carl Anthony Towns, D'Angelo Russell. Malik Beasley's a pretty good player, but... You know, I don't think it moves the needle that much. I think this team's going to be bad. Um, just looking forward, I think that they are pretty clearly one of the three or four worst teams in the Western Conference. It just really seems like a like a toxic situation with Minnesota. A culture of losing. And uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. All right, now I'm going to jump over to the 
big chunk of teams in the Eastern Conference that are eliminated from this 22-team tournament, starting with Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland finished 19-46 and on pace for 24 wins. They're last in the Eastern Conference. I just think they're really poorly run, and I don't really see a clear plan in place by the Cleveland front office. The Andre Drummond trade was pretty mystifying. You know, they were already close to last at the time of the trade. I don't really see how bringing in a pretty good center is going to help you out. They already had Tristan Thompson and Kevin Love, so the fit was strange to begin with. They gave up barely anything for Drummond, so from that perspective, it's not a huge loss, but I just don't see why they were trying to bring in a pretty good player, you know, when they should be trying to lose as many games as possible. But, you know, I guess ultimately it worked out. They finished last in the East. Yeah, this seems pretty hopeless moving forward. I do think Colin Sexton is someone that's impressed me a little bit. He's been shooting around 40% from three in his first two seasons, which to me is pretty surprising. I thought shooting was the biggest question mark about his game when he was uh, first drafted. But overall, I think Cleveland, you know, with the Kevin Love contract, uh, we'll see if Drummond uh, accepts his player option. It's around 27 million, I think, for the 2020 to 2021 season. Ultimately, I just think this team is going nowhere. Really quick, I'll talk about the Detroit Pistons, uh, 20 and 46. They finished 13th in the East. The Pistons have done such a poor job with this team. It's almost impressive. Their most valuable asset right now is Luke Kennard. And look, Kennard is probably a little bit underrated because he was drafted one spot in front of Donovan Mitchell and uh, you know, he's been playing on a terrible team, but quietly he's been 39% from three. Not a bad player. But the fact that that's their most valuable player or asset at this point is pretty remarkable. Um, they lost Drummond for practically nothing, but I thought it made sense because they were trying to bottom out. Blake Griffin seems to be done in the NBA. Uh, the injuries have just caught up to him. His contract, I think, at this point has got to be up there as one of the worst contracts in the league and this team is just filled with just no names I mean they really have a blank slate I think for the next few years if I'm Detroit I'm trying to take a couple bad contracts off other teams in exchange for draft picks uh, just to kind of build up because they really have like no assets they're totally starting from scratch from here on out a team with a lot more hope is Atlanta, finishing 20 and 47, 14th in the East. They're on pace for 24 and a half wins, roughly. This is a team that I think is actually in position to be a lot better for the 2020 2021 season. I'm just going to go over their projected crunch time five Trey Young, Kevin Herter who, by the way, on Pro Basketball Reference has the nickname the Red Mamba. Cam Reddish, maybe, or someone else can fill in that spot. But then John Collins and Clint Capella. I think this is a good team, actually. I, you know, I know that they didn't have most of those pieces healthy or with the team for this past season, but I think that's a potential eight seed, actually, next year. I think they might compete and be a little better than people realize. I mean, the East is still going to be bad next year. Uh, I think they could jump a bunch of these teams that are currently ranked in front of them uh, when the season starts over. I'm not too concerned about the fact that Trey Young doesn't play defense at all. You can hide bad defense a lot better, a lot more easily than you can hide bad offense. And Trey Young does generate a ton of offense. He's already an elite passer. Um, his shooting is really good. I think he's a special player. And if you just go around that lineup, it just, it all fits together really well. And Capella, I think, is going to work for them. I think Collins is 
very solid and probably underrated. I like that team moving forward. Now let's get to the Knicks. 21 and 45 is where they finished. The Knicks were on pace for 26 wins. Obviously there's just a layer of toxicity around this organization. Um, you know, I don't I don't even know where to start. I can't believe they did the Porzingis trade and they didn't even have it locked in with the Durant and Kyrie thing, but I won't pile on. Knicks fans have, you know, been tormented enough with all of the free agency botches. Um, I just think, you know, it'll come down to whenever Dolan decides to sell the team because, you know, since he's been there, it's just been one mistake after another. And now they just have a culture of losing. The current roster also, I'm not, I don't really like any of their young players that much. You know, I just think like I'm out on Dennis Smith Jr. Not a good enough shooter, um, too ball dominant. I'm also out on Neil Aquina, who maybe can be an okay defender at times and maybe has decent vision, but you know, in the end, his offensive game is so limited, I just don't see him being that effective of a player. Kevin Knox is someone I thought they were going to play more this season, just to kind of get a, an idea of what they've got with him, but he didn't get to play much because they signed so many veteran power forwards, and um, anyway, Knox just didn't get a lot of playing time. I guess their best asset right now um, is probably R.J. Barrett, I wasn't super impressed with him in his rookie season. I just don't think he's good enough at shooting. Um, I was a lot less into him than most people were before the 2019 draft. He's not a good shooter, also not that great of a passer. He is good at getting to the basket, but you know, defensively, we're not sure about him yet. I don't know. I just I don't think I get I got the greatest impression of him. Uh, from his rookie season, but there's a lot of time for him to get better. He's very young, so we'll see how that turns out, but I didn't love what I saw from him. Overall, I just think this team is really a disaster. Um, hopefully, they can get a higher pick in this upcoming draft, despite the fact that they finished 12th in the Eastern Conference. So 11th in the East, it's the Chicago Bulls, finishing 22-43. and 43. Chicago was on pace for 27 and a half wins. So this is a team that has stockpiled a bunch of, you know, draft picks uh, that have already been converted to players. You know, you just look at their young players. I'm not sure about Chris Dunn. I think he's more of a bench point guard. I still kind of like Markinen. I think Wendell Carter is a little bit overhyped. He just seems to be a quality bench center at this point who's pretty smart defensively, can rebound a little bit, but is offensively limited. I think it's tough for the Bulls to win games if Levine is going to be their best player. Levine, for a long time, I thought was really the king of good stats, bad team. Like, he was the, the ultimate guy you want on your fantasy team, but not on your actual team. And I still kind of get you know, shades of that when I watch him play now. He's very athletic, he's improved his shooting, but I just don't know if you want him being the guy for your team. I just don't know how many games you can win with that as your setup. Because the Bulls have all these pieces, I do think that they're a team that could potentially trade someone um, I don't know who they would target necessarily, but I just feel like the Bulls have all these young players kind of like stockpiled, and uh, I think they would be a team willing to kind of move some of those pieces for someone else. I don't know exactly what the deal would be or who would want certain guys, but you know, the core that they've built, I think is weirdly, I, I just don't think it, it works that well. I think they just need a better first option for scoring. I think if they traded Levine and, and tried to kind of rebuild that part of their team, I think they would maybe do better. Um, but yeah, right now they've got a lot of spare parts on this team. 
I don't think the future is necessarily bleak. I just think that they have some decisions to make coming up. All right, and for the final team that didn't qualify for the tournament, Charlotte, 23 and 42, finished 10th in the East. Going into this 2019-2020 season, they looked pretty miserable uh, roster-wise. And uh, they were still kind of just shaking off losing Kemba Walker for nothing, which I thought was pretty remarkable in a sense that they couldn't figure out a way to trade him. This Hornets team this past season was actually pretty well coached and uh, they were a little bit frisky. I thought that they made, you know, some good strides. They were in a terrible conference, but, you know, they actually looked competent a lot. Uh, they just seemed to be a team that, you know, played well for what they were. I really like Devontae Graham. He's a good three-point shooter. Um, his passing ability is pretty good. I just thought he was kind of a fun, exciting player on a pretty dead-in-the-water type team. And I thought that Devontae Graham and Terry Rozier actually kind of complemented each other well in the backcourt. Both those guys were shooting around 39% from three. The rest of this team, though, is... Uh, you know, pretty boring, not a lot going on. Miles Bridges can hit some dunks every now and then, but I don't know if that's a, a real cornerstone piece. I think Charlotte's got a long way to go. Uh, I don't see them competing for the playoffs next year. I think this is a perfect example of a team that the Hawks could jump for the 2020-2021 season, but at least the Hornets looked competent this past year, and they've found a pair of you know, kind of point guard plus guys who can maybe play off the ball a little bit that work well together. So, you know, they'll be interesting to see moving forward. I don't know what they're going to be like, but um, I would be pretty surprised if they were a playoff team. All right, moving on to the teams that did qualify for this tournament. I'll start out with Washington. They finished 24 and 40, which is actually an awful record now that I'm looking at it for a team that qualified. They're on pace for 31 wins. So look, Washington's not going to make any noise probably in this tournament. You know, I'd be shocked if they got in. At this point, this team has Bradley Beal and just looking to the future seasons, they've got John Wall potentially coming back. I think the opportunity cost of not trading Bradley Beal earlier is actually really high because Beal has actually been really good for them and he's kind of dragged them from like being one of the worst teams to like 30-ish wins, which I think is problematic because they could have had higher draft picks along the way. And they did all of this just to reunite John Wall and Bradley Beal. I don't actually know if John Wall is going to be very good when he comes back. You know, he's aged a little bit and he's coming off of two pretty serious injuries. You know, a guy who was already really dependent on his athleticism. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't know if that team's actually going to be that good when those guys are reunited. And uh, I think, you know, trading Beal may not sound like a great idea because you're losing by far your best asset, but... You know, if you could get like multiple picks and, you know, multiple good young players, I think it might be worth it in the long run just to, uh, you know, ride out this John Wall contract, which I think is pretty undeniably the worst contract in the NBA. All right, jumping back to the Western Conference, Phoenix finished 26 and 39. They're on pace for about 33 wins this year. So good for Phoenix for making this finally. Um, you know, this team has just been a train wreck the past several seasons. They finally have an NBA lineup that actually makes some sense. You know, the starting five, Rubio, Booker, Michael Bridges, Oubre, and DeAndre Ayton. Obviously, you know, they're not a great team, but at least the lineup makes sense, and they have five guys who can all play. The bench is pretty weak. They do have Dario Saric, but that's really about it. At least I can say this team is moving in what appears to be a positive direction moving forward. I don't think they'll make any noise in this tournament, but um, at least this team seems to be a little bit on the upswing. Then we have San Antonio finishing 27 and 36. 
San Antonio was on pace for about 35 wins this year. I think this team is just a dying team that could potentially be one of the worst teams in the league in a couple of seasons from now. We'll see if DeMar DeRozan comes back. I feel like there's a chance that DeRozan might not want to be a part of the Spurs just because it's not a good team anymore and he might opt out of his player option, which is I think for around $27 million next season. So we'll see what he does. LaMarcus Aldridge is 34. I don't see him being a contributor anymore. And if you look at the rest of this roster, I mean, it's really like deprived of talent. They've got some unproven young guys like Derek White, Lonnie Walker. Um, DeJounte Murray is really their most intriguing young guy, but he's had some injury problems and uh, he's not a great shooter, but he plays point guard and that's tough to compete with in the modern NBA. I think San Antonio, you know, obviously they deserve a lot of respect for how great they were for so long, but it has come to an end, I think. And uh, this team, I think, is you know going to go through kind of a, a tough rebuild here. Next up, we've got Sacramento, 28 and 36. The Kings were on pace for about 36 wins. I actually kind of like this team. I like De'Aaron Fox. I think for how young he is, he's actually been pretty good. I like Buddy Heald a lot. Bogdanovich was a revelation for this team. And I just think that, you know, with Harrison Barnes being there, this team could actually put out like a respectable crunch time five. So I think Sacramento is like the first team where they're actually in contention, at least, you know, they have an outside shot at maybe getting that eighth spot in the West. They'd have to play pretty well, but, you know, they have the the pieces to do it. They're not, you know, substantially worse from some of these teams in front of them, like Memphis, Portland, New Orleans. So I kind of like the Kings. I still think Luke Walton is a pretty good coach. At least he's around being an average coach. Um, you know, he's had a tough go with the whole Lakers thing, but I don't know. I, I kind of like the Sacramento Kings. I think that they actually have some, some pieces that I like. New Orleans also finished 28 and 36, also on pace for 36 wins. Of course, you know, they were unfortunately without Zion for a big chunk of the season. Otherwise, they probably would have the eighth spot right now. This team looks really fun to watch moving forward. I enjoyed watching them towards the end of the season uh, before it stopped when they had Zion. Lonzo Ball has been awesome. He's such a terrific passer. His vision is amazing. And he's a good defender, improving as a shooter. I think he's like a good piece to, to have to build around. He doesn't need the ball in his hands either. He's not super ball dominant. Brandon Ingram was shooting around 40% from three. Ingram is a guy who I think could actually have like a relatively high ceiling compared to a lot of guys his age right now. I think Ingram is someone who we're not totally sure what he ends up becoming, but his shooting has improved greatly. If he can stay healthy, I think Ingram has, you know, with his length and his size and his shooting ability, I think he could be a really interesting piece to build around. Of course, you've got Zion, and then added to that, Drew Holiday, who seems to be a perfect complement to Lonzo in that backcourt. It's a really fun team. Um, they're, you know, they've got all kinds of pieces. JJ Reddick's a nice piece. Melly was a guy who actually played well before the season stopped. I think New Orleans is going to be a tough team to play against for a lot of these middling Western Conference teams in this upcoming tournament. And I'm super excited for them. Uh, for the upcoming season, 2020, 2021, just to see this group all healthy together, hopefully, and uh, see how well they can play together. Portland is the last team that was not in a playoff spot, but is going to be in this tournament. They're 29 and 37 on pace for about 36 wins as well. 
I think this is another team. This is probably the team that I think would have the best chance at like sneaking into that eighth spot just because Damian Lillard, CJ McCollum, they've been in big playoff series before. We've seen Lillard uh, perform really well in the playoffs. And uh, I just think that, you know, of all these teams right now, Memphis, Portland, New Orleans, Sacramento, Lillard is the best player on any of those teams, I would say, today. Um, you know, you could talk about Zion in a couple of years from now, but I think Lillard is the guy you want today. Portland has been, you know, bad this season. Uh, Nurkic being out doesn't help. But ultimately, I think this team will be at least competitive for that eighth spot. I think they'll give Memphis a run. I think, you know, they'll be right there with the Kings and the Pelicans. So. Uh, I'll be excited to see them. It's fun to watch Lillard and McCollum play basketball, so that'll be exciting. All right, jumping back to the Eastern Conference, I'm just gonna go through the eight Eastern Conference teams in descending order. Starting with Orlando, they finished 30 and 35. Uh, the Magic were on pace for about 38 wins. Uh, this team pretty much only made it because the East has been so bad. They have a really weird, kind of wonky lineup. They have a lot of bigs. They've invested a lot there. Um, you know, they're good defensively. They're pretty well coached, but they just lack shooting and they lack offense. I don't see them making any noise in this postseason. They're, you know, six games in front of Washington, so I think they'll get into the Eastern Conference side of the bracket, but I think it'll be a quick exit to Milwaukee. At seven, we've got Brooklyn. They finished 30 and 34, uh, also on pace for about 38 wins. You know, I think the more intriguing thing to talk about with Brooklyn is what they look like the following season. I think this year is just kind of a lost season. You know, we're going to see a lot of Spencer Dinwiddie in this playoff. We're going to see a lot of Joe Harris. But what does this team look like with Durant and Irving coming back? for the 2020-2021 season. That's the part that I'm not as sure about. I'm sure they'll have a, a decently high over-under. I'm sure that people are gonna hype them up, but it's just weird to me that like Kyrie, the team seems to be worse when Kyrie is on the floor. That was true in Boston, it's been true in Brooklyn. I just don't know if Kyrie and Durant together are enough to be a championship contending team. I just think I trust teams more like Toronto and Boston and even Miami who just have really sound people running their organizations and really good players to build around. I think the star power of the Nets will be an interesting thing to look at for the upcoming year. At number six, Philadelphia finished 39 and 26. The Sixers were on pace for about 49 wins. 49 sounds like a lot for how seemingly miserable this team was throughout the season. Um, there's no doubt this was one of the more disappointing teams, at least for most people. I'm always a little less hyped about the Sixers than most people because it always kind of comes back to the same two things for me. Joel Embiid gets hurt a lot, and Ben Simmons still doesn't shoot, making them a really bad fit together, Embiid and Simmons. And uh, the coaching in Philadelphia, I just don't think has been, you know, that great. I think, you know, what is kind of a wonky basketball fit has not been helped by the coaching at all. Looking at the Sixers team, for this tournament. I think we're gonna see more of the same for the most part. The Sixers are gonna be able to capitalize on good matchups, but you know, they're gonna struggle against teams that can match up well against them. They went 29 and two at home this year and they were 10 and 24 on the road. Obviously this is gonna be played at a neutral site. So it's gonna be closer to being a road game set of games than home, but that's just a really bizarre split, I think, for this team. You usually don't see that dramatic of a difference between home and road record. Um, you know, teams tend to be better at home, but the Sixers are really lopsided. 
I think moving forward for this team, you know, this is kind of a hot take, but I would rather build around Ben Simmons than Joel Embiid. I think it's only a matter of time before Ben Simmons figures out a jump shot. And when he does, he's going to be a really, really effective player. He's got tremendous vision. His ability to get to the basket is unbelievable. He's also a fantastic defender. He was among the league leaders in steals, I believe, before the season stopped. Simmons really is a terrific player. I just think if he figured out a way to shoot, he would be an all-around, truly transcendent-type piece to build around. Embiid doesn't really fit with him because Simmons can't shoot at this point. If Simmons did find a way to shoot, I think Embiid would fit in better with him. So you don't have to trade Embiid, but, you know, there's not too many guys in the history of the NBA who miss two and a half years before playing where they end up having, you know, really long and successful careers. So if I were a Sixers fan or, you know, in charge of them, I would truly be considering letting you know, offers come in for Embiid and, and really listening to them because there's a chance that like three years from now, Embiid just might not be a guy that ends up playing in the NBA anymore. You know, like it's just, it seems shorter than it should be. But when you think about it, two and a half years to start his career being injured just doesn't sound like a recipe for a long and successful career. Um, when Embiid is healthy, he looks like one of the eight best players in the league, but his lack of consistency to stay on the court um, is troubling to me at least. And uh, I think this team's gonna have some really interesting decisions this off season. I think, unfortunately, it might depend on how they perform in this little tournament. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the Sixers fate is up in the air at this point, and uh, I'm interested to see what they end up doing. Indiana is also 39 and 26, also on pace for 49 wins. This Indiana team, you know, probably inflating their win total a little bit because the conference was weak. Um, this is like a hardworking, well-coached team, but you know, ultimately, I don't think they're going to make too much noise. I think their ceiling is winning one playoff series. I'll be interested to see what they do with Oladipo after this season, uh, whether or not they decide to trade him or extend him. They've got some unique players like Sabonis. Malcolm Brogdon's been good. Um, but yeah, I think the Pacers have a pretty defined ceiling. At number four, we have Miami. 41 and 24. The Heat were on pace for about 51 and a half wins. I think Miami is the one team that Milwaukee probably wouldn't want to see if it ends up being like the one seed, the eight seed, and the four five quadrant of the bracket. The Heat actually beat Milwaukee twice this year. The Heat are just well coached. They've got a great front office, good ownership. They're just one of those organizations that's just pretty buttoned up. They know what they're doing. They've got a lot of good like young pieces. Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero have been really good shooters for them. The Jimmy Butler acquisition has been good. Butler hasn't been shooting well, but he's fit in well on a good team. Bam Adebayo has been a really special player uh, with his ability to shoot, pass. I mean, he can really play point center. You know, people say it as a joke, but like he's really the definition of that. It's a very special talent. I think he's going to be one of those like guys that you just can't replace for a long time he's just going to be one of those really important players he might not put up the biggest stats on his own team but he he might be the most important player on the miami heat and then they've gotten good contributions from other guys i really like goran dragic i think he's so underrated he's been coming off the bench this year but he's been putting up good numbers he's a good shooter can pass can drive he can do everything you want him to Miami's a really solid team. I'm expecting them to be probably a little bit, but not overly threatening to Milwaukee. Miami has had success, as I've already mentioned, against the Bucks this year. So 
that's probably a team to look out for. If there was some giant upset against the Bucks, I think Miami would be the team to, to have done it. At number three, we've got Boston, 43 and 21. When the season stopped, they were on pace for 55 wins. This team is so solid. Brad Stevens is a good coach. Ainge is a very good general manager. And Jason Tatum, I think, is one of the 15 best players in the league right now. I was really impressed with him down the stretch before the season stopped. He was really starting to uh, come into his own. Jalen Brown has also been outstanding. He's creating his own shots. He's an excellent defender. The Celtics have these two interchangeable wings that can create their own shot. And they're both good defenders. They also have Kemba Walker, who during this time off probably was able to get healthy. So that's good, a good sign for Boston. They've got good depth. Uh, Gordon Hayward is still on this team. Seems like an afterthought, but he's really a quality player still for your fourth best guy. I don't know what they're going to do exactly at the five. You know, Ennis Cantor, I just don't think is good enough defensively to be playing in a lot of different matchups. They got some good contributions out of Tice before the season stopped, so I don't know if that's what their plan is, but that's like the one part of this team that I think is still a little bit questionable. But overall, they've got tons of good contributors. They've got a nice bench. I like Marcus Smart. Um, you know, this is a team that I think also has like a good amount of experience on it. So I think that they'll be calm and collected for this tournament. The two seed Toronto Raptors, they finished 46 and 18. The Raptors were on pace for 59 wins. I like this team a lot. I've just been so impressed with the front office. Nick Nurse has been a great head coach. I think their performance this year really shows that, you know, even when they won the title with Kawhi, this team still had a lot of really important contributors in that championship run. Kyle Lowry is easily a top 10 point guard. He's been really solid for them throughout. Pascal Siakam seems to be their next up and coming star player. He was really starting to put together a lot more consistency this year compared to last year. He's consistently gotten better since he's gotten in the league. And then, you know, the Raptors front office, they just continue to pull these guys in like the later part of the first round or even guys in the second round or undrafted guys like Terrence Davis was making a big impact. But OG Anunobi is like this good, versatile, defensive oriented wing player you know, another guy they just pulled from like the later part of the first round. And, you know, this team, I think I would trust as much as any team in the league uh, at, you know, drafting players. I think their process is just really sound. They pick guys that'll fit in with their organization. They pick smart players, really smart front office in Toronto. This team also has a fair amount of depth going into this playoff tournament. I think that they'll be a competitive team and quite honestly, I think that it wouldn't shock me if they ended up representing the East again. Uh, I think this team is just really solid to the core. They're really well coached and organized. I think they're just going to be a really good team. And uh, if Milwaukee somehow doesn't end up, you know, representing the East, I think Toronto has a really good shot at being that team. The Milwaukee Bucks, 53 and 12. Milwaukee was on pace for 67 wins. They had the best winning percentage of any team in the NBA at 81.5%. Their differential on average per game was plus 11.2. That's not only the best in the league by far this season, but that is like historically good. Um, I know that their conference is weak, but Milwaukee is really a special team uh, this season. Despite having the best record, I don't think that they should be the favorite to win the title, but I definitely think that they should be the favorite in the Eastern Conference. To me, it's their conference to lose. Giannis has got to be the best player in the world right now. 
Giannis has dramatically improved his shooting. Last year, shooting around 25.5% from three. This year, around 30.5%. If he keeps on getting better, you know, he's going to be a really difficult guy to deal with for really every other team in the NBA. Obviously, his ability to get to the basket is remarkable. Um, his length is ridiculous. He's a good passer, too, and he's a very good defender. And the Bucks have built a perfect team around him. They've got a ton of shooting. I think Eric Bledsoe, despite you know not always being the most reliable guy in a big spot, is actually the type of point guard you want to have with Giannis. George Hill has been a really good player off the bench. Every time I watch the Bucks, I feel like George Hill just comes in and does like four or five things that I like and then he goes off. Um, shooting around 49% from three, George Hill, really remarkable. Chris Middleton's a really good player to kind of surround Giannis with, another really good three-point shooter. And they've got all kinds of guys on the bench, DiVincenzo, Ursan Ilyasova, Kyle Korver's there. Brooke Lopez shoots now, so that's someone. Wesley Matthews has, you know, kind of revitalized his career. I think the number one argument against Milwaukee is that you don't necessarily trust anyone on this team outside of Giannis, but they have such a volume of good shooters that I think that this team will probably be okay. Um, you know, as long as Giannis is there. And with his improved shooting, I think that this team will probably be able to come out of the East. All right, and jumping back to the Western Conference, the eighth team was Memphis. They finished 32 and 33. The Grizzlies were on pace for about 40 and a half wins. So right around 500. You know, they're gonna have a bright future with John Morant and Jaron Jackson Jr. They, for right now, don't have a ton of other pieces surrounding those guys, but, you know, Memphis will be a good team for a long time. This will be a good tournament for Ja and uh, Triple J to kind of get their feet wet, you know, know what it means to play in some meaningful games for them. So we'll see if they're able to hang on to that eighth spot. They do have, you know, around a three-game lead over um, the other teams in line. So Memphis does have an advantage going into this, but their schedule is difficult. You know, it's worth mentioning that the Pelicans had some of their tougher opponents earlier in the 2019-2020 season, and Memphis had kind of an easier schedule until um, the season stopped. And so for this tournament, Memphis does have a lot more difficult of a schedule than New Orleans specifically. Um, and, you know, Memphis even has a harder schedule than even like Portland or Sacramento. So we'll see what the Grizzlies end up doing. Uh, they've got a really bright future though. In the seventh spot, we've got Dallas, 40 and 27. The Mavericks were on pace for 49 wins. I really like this team. The Mavericks are sixth in the NBA in average differential per game at plus 6.1. The only teams in front of them are the two LA teams, Milwaukee, Toronto, and Boston. I think there's an argument that the Mavericks are one of like the six or seven best teams in the league. Offensively, they just have so much firepower. And I'm really hoping that Dallas ends up getting matched up with like a Denver, because I think that Dallas could pull the upset. And I kind of just want to see like Doncic play more basketball. Uh, I just, I love Luka Doncic. He's really remarkable to watch. I would say he's one of the 10 best players in the league. I know he's not great defensively, but his ability to get other people involved is really amazing. Tremendous passer. He can shoot. The only downside with Dallas is that I don't know if Porzingis is like the best second player to have on your team, but he seems to fit in pretty well. Doncic is a pretty like workable player, can fit in with a lot of different pieces. And uh, after those two guys, it is, you know, a little bit of a drop off, but they do have other players. You know, Seth Curry has really been a nice three point shooting piece to have, and they're well coached. So I think Dallas has the potential to make some noise. 
depending on who they're matched up with, I think they do a lot better against a team like Denver than a team like the Clippers. At number six, it's Houston, 40 and 24. The Rockets were on pace for 51 wins. This team had kind of a roller coaster season. A lot of it was really just due to Westbrook's kind of emergence. Uh, Westbrook started out just terribly with this team. Towards the beginning of the year, Westbrook was shooting more threes per game, and his percentages were just so bad. I love watching Westbrook. I think the way he competes is really special. I think he's just so competitive, and it's fun to watch him you know, work harder than seemingly every other player. And I think the Rockets really figured out a way to use him properly. For a long time now, it just seems to be optimal for Westbrook to be shooting fewer threes and to be driving more. And they've surrounded him with shooters and it's really worked. And they were able to stagger the minutes between him and Harden pretty well. Westbrook finished the season in a 53 game sample with 47% field goal percentage. He was around, he was over 50% for the last couple months before the season stopped. Unfortunately, I mean, he finished the year 25.4% from three. So, you know, that is really bad. I mean, for a guy who's scoring 27 and a half points per game, that is remarkably low. But Westbrook's competitiveness uh, mixed in with Harden, who you could argue is one of the six best guys in the league, probably. This team has some really good upside. Now, at the trade deadline, they did something that a lot of people criticized right off the bat. They traded a first rounder and Capella, basically, just to bring in Covington. Um, Perhaps an underrated part of that move is that they saved a lot of cap space, but, you know, I think the common fan was looking at it and just thinking, well, you know, who's going to play center for them? Towards the beginning of the time after they made that trade, they went on a nice little win streak. Uh, They looked really good. And then towards the end of the season before it stopped, they weren't playing as well. You know, I think ultimately, it's not going to matter whether or not they have Clint Capella. You know, Daryl Morey is trying to exploit an inefficiency at this point. Small ball is what a lot of teams are doing now, and it makes sense in a lot of ways to just go small the entire time, especially when they've got Harden and Westbrook. You know, the way the Rockets play If Houston were to get matched up with a team like Utah, Gobert wouldn't be playable in a series like that. So Houston does present some matchup problems with how they've constructed their team. Um, You know, they don't have a ton of depth, but they've been good at just plugging in guys. I mean, this team really just runs through Harden and Westbrook. And, uh, you know, the downside to this Houston team is that we've seen Harden and Westbrook play a lot worse than expected in some playoff series along the way. Um, But, you know, I think overall this team is interesting and uh, I'm curious to see how much longer Westbrook can compete at this level, you know? He he gives it all he's got all the time, um, but at a certain point, you know, he's gonna reach an age where his body just doesn't align with his mentality Um, I'm wondering when that's going to be, because if Westbrook continues to play this well, the trade won't look as bad as it could, because he's going to be on the books for a year longer than Chris Paul, and uh, he's a lot more predicated on his athleticism than Chris Paul is. Speaking of Chris Paul, we'll talk about the Thunder, who also went 40-24 and on pace for around 51 wins. This was the good surprise team of the NBA, I think, Oklahoma City. I thought they'd be competing maybe for an eighth spot, but, you know, to be this good is really um, impressive. Uh, This team has a good front office, a good uh, coaching staff, and, uh, you know, when Chris Paul is on basketball teams, they tend to be good because he's a really smart and efficient player. 
He sets up other people well. He's a good shooter, excellent passer. And uh, he's just your very prototypical point guard, uh, but he just does so many things well. This team is going to be perhaps a little bit more interesting to talk about in like a long-term perspective because of how many picks they've accumulated. I'll be curious to see what they do with some of their current pieces in the off season, but you know, for this upcoming tournament, the downside for the Thunder is that despite how good their record is, they do have um, the lowest point differential per game uh, of any team that qualified for the playoffs except for Memphis. So the Thunder are only plus two and a half point differential per game. I don't know if I would favor the Thunder against really any of these teams that they might have to play, but they are going to be competitive and uh, they've gotten really good contributions from a lot of different guys. Shea Gilgis Alexander looks like the real deal. When I watch him drive to the basket, he just looks special. Um, He's got that scoring ability. He and Paul have been a really good duo together. Danilo Gallinari has also been a really nice player for them. Gallinari, a guy who, if he were just healthy more often, I think would have a much better reputation around the league as just being a really quality player. Um, This team doesn't have a ton of depth, but I think they're going to be fine uh, to at least just be a competitive team in this tournament. And number four, we've got Utah. They're 41 and 23. On pace for around 52 and a half wins. You know, I like this Jazz team, but I think that they are, you know, kind of entering in a situation that doesn't favor them. If they get matched up with Houston, as I've already mentioned, I think it's going to be bad news for them. I don't think Gobert is going to be super playable. Boyan Bogdanovich is going to be out for this, so that's really one of their best scoring options outside of Donovan Mitchell, who's not going to be there. I think this Jazz team might turn into, you know, kind of surrounding Donovan Mitchell as like the alpha scorer and not a lot else going on. Um, I still like, you know, elements of this team, but without Bogdanovich, I think that, you know, they might run into some problems. I could still see them winning a, a series, of course, but I think it depends on who they get matched up with. Of course, they're really well coached. I think Quinn Snyder is excellent. But, you know, I think this team could run into some problems depending on who they're matched up with. At number three, we've got Denver, 43 and 22. The Nuggets were on pace for 54 and a half wins. So Denver is my ultimate team where I'd be more surprised if they made it to the finals than I would be if they got bounced in the first round. They don't have a lot of experience. They rack up regular season wins. Over the past two seasons, you know, they've been really good at home. They've been subpar on the road. They don't have that good of a differential. I'd be so surprised if this team ever represented the West I think the problem with Denver is just that after Jokic, there's really not that second guy that you really want to depend on in a big playoff series. And I think just looking at how Denver played last postseason is really a good indication of what this team is. They go to a seventh game with San Antonio, and then they go to a seventh game with Portland. They beat San Antonio, lose to Portland. I just think that's really where they're at. They're inexperienced, but they're talented. And so, you know, San Antonio, obviously not the greatest competition, but perhaps maybe a better coach team. I just think ultimately Denver's second scoring option being probably Jamal Murray at this point uh, might not be good enough to compete with the two L.A. teams. All right, now I'm going to talk about the two L.A. teams together. The Clippers actually finished second in the West, 44 and 20. Clippers were on pace for 56 and a half wins. The Lakers finished 49 and 14. The Lakers were on pace for 64 wins. The current odds for each of these teams to win the title, the Lakers are the favorites at plus 190 and the Clippers are at plus 300. The Clippers went two and one against the Lakers in the regular season. 
Personally, right now, I'm favoring the Lakers over the Clippers. And uh, actually, before the 2019-2020 season started, I actually was kind of leaning the other way. I thought the Clippers might be the better of the two teams. I think what's really surprised me is just how much seemingly better Davis has been versus Paul George. I think that, you know, LeBron has been about what you'd expect, uh, if not a little better than that. Kawhi has been really good. Very quietly, Kawhi has actually been playing some of the best basketball of his career in a Clippers uniform. But Davis has been a lot better than Paul George. Paul George has really not played a lot of minutes, and he's been kind of strung along here, uh, missing a lot of games uh, to rest. But yeah, I'm not worried about Paul George not being you know, healthy enough because he's had a lot of time to rest. This stoppage of the season, I think, actually benefits the Clippers a lot more than any other team because Kawhi and Paul George were clearly nursing injuries as the season was going along. They've had a lot of time to rest, and I think that, you know, the Clippers were also a team that just didn't actually have, like, a lot of team chemistry. The Lakers were a lot more fluid together. They were, you know, just seemingly more coordinated as a team. The Clippers were kind of like a group of guys and a lot of isolation players, not a lot of, of, you know, cohesiveness. So, you know, I'm not worried about Paul George health wise, but um, I will say that, you know, Paul George has not exactly been the best in big moments in the past. I think, you know, given that Davis is playing alongside LeBron, I think that I might trust that duo a little bit more than Kawhi and Paul George, even though I love Kawhi and everything he does as far as depth on these two teams you know I do think the Clippers have better depth uh, I don't think it's substantially better um, I do like Montrez Harrell I think Patrick Beverly is a really good and useful player especially for playoff situations the addition of Marcus Morris I think is okay Lou Williams is good Landry Shamit has been a good player um I thought the Reggie Jackson addition was actually a little bit more negative than positive. Um, you know, I just think that he's a guy where I don't always like his his passing. Uh, I don't always like his decision making with shots. Um, he's a low percentage shooter guy who isn't afraid to kind of take a big shot at any moment, which I think is a negative because there's a lot of other guys I'd rather see shoot in a big moment on this team. Um, so ultimately, I think, you know, there's some good depth on this Clippers team. There's a lot of duplication with guys who like to ISO score. Again, I don't think this team has the greatest chemistry, but they are really talented. They are really good defensively. And uh, I think that this is a team that you have to, you know, be wary of if you're a fan of the Lakers. Looking at the Lakers depth, which I don't think is that bad. You know, the third best player on this team might be Danny Green, but they've got a lot of guys that are kind of his caliber. I think Contavious Caldwell Pope, a little bit underrated. He was shooting 39% from three this year. I don't know, he's a lengthy defender. I feel like he gets a lot of uh, criticism for, you know, not the greatest reasons. Some other players the Lakers do have. Rajon Rondo, if he comes back as playoff Rondo, I mean, this is a guy who is one of the more intelligent players in the league. Terrific passer. His shooting has improved um, to the point where at least you feel good about him shooting like an open three. And uh, he had great synergy with Anthony Davis, uh, even back in New Orleans. So... If Rondo puts it together, that could be an asset. Kuzma's all right. He plays defense pretty well. Um, very inconsistent offensively. You know, the Lakers brought in Deion Waiters. They also just signed J.R. Smith. Um, I think that those two can easily replace uh, Avery Bradley, who people are making out to be like a real asset for the Lakers. I just think that, you know, the fact that Avery Bradley won't be at the tournament it doesn't help them, but you know I don't think it's too big of a deal. Dwight Howard has had a nice little renaissance to his career playing off the bench. 
And so, you know, overall, I just think this Lakers team has, you know, enough guys to to build around with LeBron and Davis to the point where I think that this team should be favored. They're plus 190 right now to win the title. They had better odds before the season stopped, so I don't think that plus 190 is necessarily the thing you want to bet on, but um, I think the Lakers should be the favorites at this point. Even though the Clippers beat the Lakers twice earlier in the season, um, the Lakers really started to look like the best team in the league right before the season stopped. They beat Milwaukee and the Clippers, I think, within a week of each other. Also, from a more mythical perspective, you know, potential storylines that I could kind of foresee happening would be like, you know, with the unfortunate and tragic death of Kobe Bryant, the Lakers come back and, you know, win a title. And then with the whole MJ documentary, it's like it could reopen the door for, you know, the LeBron supporters to to get their word in and for people to start arguing about how this season has an asterisk next to it and it's not a full title. I think all those things are in play, and uh, I could see those all being big storylines after this season finishes, which hopefully the season happens uh, at all. Hopefully we we do get to do this tournament uh, in late July.